Gabby. Welcome to the Happier Life Project, brought to you by free mental health and wellness app, My Possible Self, in partnership with the Priory Healthcare. To close off our three episodes exploring self-love and how we can take practical, compassionate steps to treat ourselves more kindly, accept ourselves fully, and put our own health and happiness in high regard. I am speaking to self-love therapist, Tasha Bailey. Tasha is a qualified and accredited psychotherapist, award-winning influencer and content creator, specializing in mental health. She is also a writer and speaker. To close the gap between therapy and the wider world, Tasha uses social media to share psychoeducation via her Instagram platform at realtalk.therapist. It's since drawn audiences from around the world. Tasha has also presented in mental health talks, workshops and discussion panels for brands such as Universal Music, Nike and Spotify. Her experience in this area includes teaching various audiences about mental health, self-love, trauma and confidence. Tasha has incredible advice to share and was an absolute joy to talk to. In this conversation, she's going to destigmatize a lot of myths around what self-love is. She offers practical advice on how we can softly put our self-love into practice. And she's got a great and hilarious, actually, suggestion for how to respond to that pesky negative voice that holds us back and puts us down. So, ready to find a healthier, happier you? Let's get started. Hi, Tasha. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the Happier Life Project. You're a psychotherapist, content creator, and social media influencer, a writer, and congratulations as well on being awarded 2022's Health and Wellbeing Creator of the Year by the Blogsphere Awards. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. It was like such a such a blessing. Like it was. I want to say it's a surprise because like a lot of my followers were like, oh, I've nominated you and that was really lovely. But it was kind of quite a humbling moment because I created my platform not thinking that any of that would happen. I would, I didn't even think that I would show my face on my platform. I just thought I'd share some psychoeducation around uh, healing and mental health and self-love. And that's how it started. And then I kind of started to show more of myself and my story and create more of a community mm. and then it's been awarded and seen and recognized um so yeah it was a really humbling experience I think and without sounding too much like an Instagram creeper I loved your dress <laughs> oh thank you me like, too oh, <laughs> dress is gorgeous it's like the most the most pink and, and like yeah. like big dress I could ever find and it was just amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah it looked it so speaking of your Instagram you call yourself a self-love therapist so this is clearly an area that you know loads about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes yeah yeah not only working one-on-one with clients but also via talks workshops and discussion panels you've educated in this area so we've come to the right person <laughs> yay <laughs> I'm in the right place <laughs> yeah, yay okay so a bit about you and your background first and going right to the beginning of your journey on your website you said growing up conversations about mental health and self-care were sparse and tainted with shame the idea of therapy itself was a myth So I'm curious if, and you don't need to get too personal, but in terms of like growing up, when you were a youngster, did you feel like you needed therapy, um, but it wasn't available to you? Or, I mean, did your family think that maybe because you were too young to think that? I'd love to know your origins in that respect. So a bit bit of background for me is that I am um, Black British, Jamaican. My parents came from Jamaica when, when they were kind of children in the 50s and 60s and I grew up in like East London kind of working class family the other part of that is that I have an older brother who's a lot older than me and he has uh, schizophrenia Mm. so I kind of grew up kind of knowing 
well seeing what mental health looks looked like but no one really explaining to me what was happening or what it meant what schizophrenia was like no one actually had that conversation with me um and I was observing this from like a really young age from like five years old or so Mm -hmm. um so it always left me this with this curiosity about you know what what is happening what does it mean what is mental health how do we look after mental health what could have you know helped this whole process for me for my family for my brother and I think yeah definitely as an adolescent I had a lot of questions I had my own anxieties I had like you know difficult things you know being a black girl in in London can be quite difficult and I always saw therapy but on TV and like American TV (laughs) yeah um and I was like oh that looks really cool like I, I didn't even know it was accessible I don't think even at the time it was accessible actually in the UK but I saw that and I was like, oh, I really want to do that job. I really want to help children have conversations and um, talk about their feelings because probably that's not what that's what I didn't receive myself. So it kind of led me to that path from quite a, a young age. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what's great now is that there are a lot more therapists in the UK. There's a lot of schools with therapists in them, which I think is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, definitely like the lack of knowing that that was accessible for me led me to kind of Mm. wanted to actually be part of the solution for that problem the conversation's definitely opening up but you're making me smile referring to like America and I lived there for six years in Nashville and the way they would talk about going to see a therapist was like I'm going to get my roots done you know I'm going to the hairdresser (laughs) which is actually really admirable and I do think we are heading in that direction but um yeah it's it's so sad well, in my experience with the people I was sort of mixing with and working with, it's said with such ease. Whereas mm-hmm. I think in the UK, it's still like, you know, oh, I'm going to see a therapist. It's kind of like a oh kind of thing, you know? Yeah, it's like a little bit of like embarrassment or a little bit of shame or mm-hmm. it's we're revealing too much of ourselves or something. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a the thing of like, we are wondering, okay, I'm going to say I'm going to therapy, but what what do they are they going to think about me? Do they think that I'm crazy? Do they think that yeah. I'm, you know, too much? Like, what is that other person's fantasy about me going to therapy? I I do think that the younger generations though are talking about it in a slightly different way. I think I saw a stat where it was like 34 percent of like Gen X Y Z are like more likely to go to therapy than. The older generation so I think there's some kind of something changing there mm. but there is still this like wall of oh it's therapy oh you yeah. go to therapy what do you talk about you know it's, it's this mystery yeah yeah definitely and we could veer off into a whole different podcast episode you know when you mentioned about your brother and, and observing him um with his struggles with schizophrenia and something that we've talked about in my possible self is doing a podcast episode on you know when you live closely with or you've you've got family members that are struggling with mental health because that does affect your mental health as well because you're seeing somebody you love struggling yeah so that's really interesting that like most guests that I've spoken to the sort of catalyst or the inspiration for them then going on to work in different fields of mental health is because of their struggles um, but with you, it's it's a, a family member. Yeah, and actually, you know, they do class that as a trauma, you know, to have mm. a loved one that you lived with who has a mental health difficulty is often a um, an ace. The adverse childhood experiences, you know, it's a, it's a type of trauma that a child will go through because it's it puts a t- different pressure on them. Whether they've got to be more um, parentified, they've got to be more less of a child and more of an adult to, mm. to, to look after the household for the gap that that's in, then in place you know so yeah it is it's a huge yeah huge, uh, experience yeah yeah definitely very complex so your journey as a therapist started when you were a teenager um you said you didn't grow then again I'm pulling this from your website you didn't grow up with the appropriate language for your emotions so you began to use art and poetry to make sense of them this later led you on the path to train as an integrative therapist for young people and adults, encouraging them to use creativity for self-expression. That is really cool. And that's actually more, I don't want to make light of journaling because I know how important and valuable that can be. But I think actually, you know, go, going a bit more creative in terms of poetry and painting might actually be a bit less daunting, I would say, if somebody doesn't just want to spill their guts 
mm-hmm. you know, taking pen to paper kind of thing. What do you think? Mm-hmm. I totally agree. I feel like a lot of us don't always have the words for our emotions. That There's mm. so many emotion words, but we, we don't know most of them. <laughs> yeah. There's like 80 emotion words, but we are limited to like happy, sad, angry, um, guilty. That's like the four that we kind of are most likely to speak about. But when we're drawing or writing poetry or even just finding song, ly- song lyrics or metaphor, it gives us a different way to communicate outside of this like these little short words it gives us Mm -hmm. like you know I have a a client who I love working with because we both love Harry Potter and so sometimes when we're talking about certain feelings rather than talking about the feelings we're talking about maybe a metaphor in Harry Potter that describes better what that experience is for that client Mm -hmm. if that makes sense so I think it's finding like different ways to communicate other than just words like words are great yeah but they don't always do it justice to like how powerful the experience actually is yeah and it becomes that I should as well because I've thought oh I should be journaling and I'm like I can't I don't really want to (laughs) and so I don't you know whereas like if I was doing something like oh I might just try my hand at a bit of poetry or, or drawing it might that seems like more of a fun task to do with some real holistic benefits yeah, and it's also engaging. I always get them mixed up, but the side of the brain that's creative is the side of the brain that is also um, regulates our emotions. So when we're doing art and when we're doing painting or knitting or you know writing a poem, it's actually connecting the part of our brain that's actually going to help to soothe our emotions and make sense of them. Whereas the other side of the brain is like the logical brain. It's the I need to find a word like I don't know it's it's quite limiting to just rely on that side of the brain so actually we need a bit of both oh wow I didn't know that I thought this was worth highlighting again on your website and it links to the overarching theme of the episode about self-love you point out traditionally therapy hasn't always been modern and culturally inclusive so you're very passionate about wanting to help destigmatize that You said it's your life's purpose to make mental health and wellness talk feel relevant, real and inclusive. So, yeah, again, I'm just kind of curious in terms of your observations in and out of the therapy room, if you will. I mean, London is very diverse, right? You mentioned you're in London. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so London is very diverse. I would say as well, I was talking to someone about this before, that therapy I think is more accessible in London because it's such a big city there's more you know availability of therapists and different types of therapists and different yeah um you know if you want a black female therapist you're more likely to find them in London than you are in in the rest of the country or the the UK but the therapy world is still very white it is still very Eurocentric it is still very middle age, middle class, mm. because it's a really expensive career to go into. It's absolutely so expensive to become a psychotherapist. And so it limits the amount of people that can become psychotherapists. So a lot of the time you don't have um, enough therapists that reflect the clients that want to access therapy, mm. if that makes sense. Makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've been to some therapists and um, not connected at all with them. And, and I just yeah you know white middle-aged and just not on the same wavelength at all and um yeah I completely agree with that you use real talk to help you heal what did you mean by that so with that I mean there's a few things I'm thinking about so firstly it's (laughs) like there's this thing that like when we talk about mental health generally there's like this like elephant in the room it's like everyone gets a bit awkward and it's like everyone starts looking to the floor and no one wants to say too much and I think it's a thing it's a a shame isn't it it's a shame of like I don't want to make myself look bad or I want people to feel sorry for me or I want people to look down on me um so there's this kind of like awkwardness so there's Mm -hmm. that part I, I want to kind of cut through all of that bs and just be like we all have mental health. We all have something that we have to look after mm-hmm. and it dips and it, it sometimes it dips and sometimes it doesn't dip. Sometimes it it's, you know, thriving, but we can still share that journey and it's important to share that journey. And then the other thing is that I think in psychotherapy, as therapists learn lots of big words, which are great and lots of big like knowledge. And sometimes we don't necessarily, sh- either we do share it with our clients and then it's a bit it's a bit too much information. It's like really like jargony and like what the yeah. hell. 
um, or we we hold it to ourselves and we we don't share that information. So it's kind of for me, we will talk is kind of find that balance between how do I pass on my psychotherapy knowledge to my clients, but in a way that's digestible, that's fun, that's relatable, that you know they can talk about with their friends, like something that they can actually hold on to and make sense of. And for me, that's what real talk is. Mm. So for example, with attachment, it's like how do we talk about that in a way that I could talk to my client and then they could take it to brunch with their friends and talk about attachment there in a way that's fun and like engage into their group. So it's kind of that. Right. Nice. Making it accessible. Can we talk about your journey with Mm self-love? Do you love yourself now? And did you always love yourself? Oh, juicy. Um, (laughs) I do love myself, but I think love self-love is like, it's not a yes or no question. Um, I've definitely struggled I feel like I feel like yeah I feel like self-love is like it's not a thing that you have or you don't have it's a thing that you're you're always having to work on Mm. Um, and again it dips or it thrives so there's definitely been times where um, I've struggled and I think mostly it's been times when I feel like I don't belong so even that thing of like you know being the only not the only but one of the few plus size women who's a psychotherapist or the few black women or the few women of my age or whatever it is that can create doubt it can create kind of this thing of like oh do I deserve to be here or do I have anything to offer here or whatever bad experiences we've had in the past Mm. of self-doubt or of I'm not good enough they get triggered when we suddenly don't feel belong that we belong in an Mm. adult situation so those are the moments that maybe that I have to like Oh, take a step back. Uh, what's going on here? What's happening right now? Okay, l- let me like reaffirm myself, give myself that love that I need. So then I can step into that room and be the person that I, I am and that I need to be. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, you know, those those struggles are like moments that I then have to rebalance myself. If that makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like self-love is kind of your self-prescription, right? When you mm-hmm. when when those worries come come into play, and I notice that you do work with clients who struggle with identity, and would this mm-hmm. be passion based on your own personal experience, and and you can I guess really put yourself in the client's position there and and help them reframe what's going on, yeah, to the I- best one can when you know it's pro- problems yeah. in that respect. Absolutely, I think it is like you know. Yeah, my own experience is knowing that actually that need is there. And also that I have to have awareness that I can't fit every intersection of a client. So I'm I'm not a trans person. So but I then need to do the work so that if I have a trans client, I can be as present and as helpful to them as I can. Mm. So that's kind of like my, you know, my hope that if I have a client that's, that looks like me in front of me, then yeah, I'm there for them. But if there's someone that doesn't or someone has a different experience, I then do need to work so hard to ensure that I'm the right person for them in that moment as well. Yeah, well, I guess as well, like in many different ways, we can all struggle with identity. And so I wonder, and I'm not going to, you know, even trivialize to say, what are the tips and tricks for anybody suffering with you know, identity and self-love? But for anybody listening now that might be struggling with their place in the world, do you have any words of assurance, um, again, relating back to self-love, self-compassion that you could offer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, oh, there's so much. <laughs> um, I would say that one of the most important things is if you do struggle with identity or belonging, the most important thing is to find your tribe mm. and to find people that you do feel like see you and validate you and, you know, people who encourage you to be who you are um, rather than tell you to make yourself smaller. It's so important to find those people. It's like your chosen family. It can be an absolute mission to find them. Yes. Mm-hmm. But once you do, you know, you'll have that chosen family so that in those difficult times you can lean into them. The other thing is that the world is problematic, right? <laughs> like, um, mm-hmm. And I think a lot of the times when we have identity issues, we're taking the world's problems and seen us as the problem rather than the world as the problem, if that makes sense. So, oh, so wow, yeah. with, 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 with imposter syndrome, that happens a lot. So 
I might, you know, go into a workplace where everybody's white and male. And then I'm going to be like, oh, my God, I'm not good enough at this. And why am I here? And this is a this is a mistake. Why do they hire me? Like, I'm going to go into that place. But the problem is not me and what I'm doing. The problem is that maybe I'm the only black woman in the whole of 100 people. And so I'm doubting myself because of whether I feel like I don't belong. So it's kind of like trying to have that awareness or that insight of like, OK, what's actually going on here? Is it actually me or is it actually a them problem? And then what needs to happen? Oh, my God, that is, that is such amazing advice right there. And um, because you brought up imposter syndrome, like, again, you've just pretty much said those who suffer from imposter syndrome must struggle with self-love. And for anybody mm. that needs the clarification on imposter syndrome, it's a psychological occurrence in which an individual doubts their skills, talents or accomplishments and has a persistent internalised fear of being exposed as a fraud. So do you work now with many imposter syndrome sufferers and helping them get to that place of self-compassion, you know, up in their Mm self-esteem, bringing them to that place of self-care, self-love? And what techniques do you use? Yeah, I think it does come up a lot. It comes up a lot for, it comes up a lot for women. Mm Uh, non-binary people it Mm. comes up a lot for people of color it comes up a lot for anyone that's had a bit of a perfectionist Mm -hmm. um childhood household or or a perfectionist characteristic within themselves and I think it apparently comes up a lot for anyone that's like an oldest child I'm not too sure why Mm. that is but um whether it's something about you know having to be the the role model of the family and so that there's, there's so much pressure and all that stuff potentially so it does come up a lot and I think naturally it comes up a lot when we go into a new job or into a new atmosphere or out of our comfort zone because we you know the fear kind of takes over of yeah. oh my gosh am I in the right place and I think one of the one thing that really helps with that is to find your cheerleader so whether it's like a manager or a mentor or someone else that's been in the same role that you can like touch base with every now and again and just say hey I'm feeling that imposter syndrome feeling can you can you help me (laughs) and then they can kind of like be like okay well what's the evidence that you are an imposter what have you been doing that's been really well and you say blah 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 and what have you been doing that's been saying that you don't deserve to be here and you're like oh um well actually I have been doing my job so Mm -hmm. (laughs) I do deserve to be like so having that person to just like you know challenge you and also to have I used to do this when I worked in a different field I used to have like a folder an email folder and also a physical folder where anytime I received positive feedback or um, a recognition or I did a piece of work that I was really proud of I put it in that folder and then when the imposter syndrome came up I would be like well I need to go to my folder and remind myself that actually I'm good at my job um and like just going through and look and it just levels the the anxiety a bit it, it levels everything up a little bit yeah, yeah yeah and being your own cheerleader as well as you know getting it elsewhere right that must be important absolutely but for some people that can be really hard yeah because true. if you've never experienced um positive um, unconditional love if you've never experienced affirmation growing up you would have internalized that mm. um so one reason why some people find affirmations really cringy is because they've never experienced that kind of love and so when they see it in an affirmation like you know you are strong you are beautiful whatever it is it's like Ugh, what is that I, I, that's a bit foreign um so yeah it's kind of like it can be really hard to start to be a cheerleader for yourself you've never had had to have that before so it's great to like then internalize it through new experiences and stuff like that yeah well I'm gonna take that thread and run with it as well about the the sort of cringe factor because Mm. when you think about conceptualizing self-love and listeners can do this right now as well so try to imagine what you do for yourself how you talk to yourself and how you'd feel about yourself that reflects love and concern like you'd practice to a loved one To me, that feels ick, and I get the ick, and I always have, you know, when it's something about the word even self-love, is that kind of, I cringe and I I recall, and and I I think I'm not alone in that as well. Mm -hmm. 
And it made me think of when I was speaking to a previous podcast guest about um, inner child, doing inner child work. And, and I, it was the same feeling of the, when it's about speaking to you inner child and giving you inner child some love, I'd get the ick. And then mm. he pointed out, well, would you get the ick speaking to any other child? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And I said, well, no, of course. And he said, well, that means, you know, you, you clearly need to, to, to do the work. There's something... going on there and I was like oh okay (laughs) Mm. and is that the same with self-love do you think it's like it it, I don't know it feels a bit cringe yeah and I have this theory that we cringe at the things that we need the most but are too shy to receive if that makes sense oh my god that's so deep and profound we cringe at the things that we need the most but we're too shy to receive yeah so (sighs) How do we bulldoze our way through the cringe? <sighs> lean into the cringe, just lean, lean. into it. <laughs> as, as, easy as, as easy as that sounds, it's not that easy. But I, I think there is something about leaning into the cringe or maybe doing baby steps into it. So, for mm-hmm. example, if self-love is a word that makes you feel, Ugh, change the word or or find a, you know, you know, you've got like Ribena where you like dilute it a little bit with water. <laughs> Imagine my beaner is the, the whole cordial. I'm really digging walk. where this is going, by the way. Please continue. <laughs> find, a, find a more watered down version of self love. Start yeah. there and yeah. then build up to have more and more my beaner, right? So <laughs> maybe it's like you don't want to focus on self love yet, but maybe it's about how can I be a little bit more communicative with myself or how can I be a mm. bit more kind to myself I know some people find that a little bit cringy as well but you know it's finding like different words that you're maybe more that feel a bit more digestible for you and then working through that so you get to a point where you're like shooting the Ribena (laughs) on the rocks no dilution (laughs) exactly (laughs) that's the goal yeah well I actually I'd be interested to know your take on this I was looking at a blog post on psychcentral.com and they shared examples of what self-love can look like in action and I found this helpful for me at least when it came to like the ick factor so they said self-love looks like saying positive things to yourself forgiving yourself when you mess up meeting your own needs being assertive not letting others take advantage of or abuse you, prioritizing your health and well-being, spending time around people who support you and build you up and avoiding people who don't, asking for help, letting go of grudges or anger that hold you back, recognizing your strengths, valuing your feelings, making healthy choices most of the time, Living in accordance with your values. Sorry, this is quite a long list. A few more. Pursuing your interests and goals. Challenging yourself. Holding yourself accountable. Giving yourself healthy treats. Accepting your imperfections. Setting realistic expectations. Noticing your progress and effort. So that list doesn't give me the ick at all. So perhaps, like you said, we're misguided by the term self-love. And what I love about that list is it's like a mixture of, yes, give yourself, like have positive talk with yourself, give yourself healthy treats. But it's like a balance of the of the nurture. Mm-hmm. But there's also kind of challenge. Mm-hmm. There's also like the, the, the parenting yourself, the make sure that you hold yourself accountable, the challenge yourself. It's almost like a parent has to give nurture Mm-hmm. but it also has to give boundaries mm. they also have to give back you can't have one without the other you need to have both and there's something about how do I then be a better parent to myself than mm. I have been or that I have received before yeah yeah it's almost a bit like well one of them is holding yourself accountable but like it just sounds quite practical doesn't it it's not sort mm. of all lovey-dovey even with the wording it's like notice your progress and effort like you know it's yeah. it's like okay let's get down to business kind of thing which which yeah I appreciated as well I think as well as humans we love a checklist so <laughs> there's something as well I'll be like okay yep yeah, done that yep yeah, on that like tick. there's something about that rather than self-love being this kind of like two words that or one word whatever that it's quite 
mysterious. Yeah. But for people that, you know, struggle with that, oh, I give, treat myself to a bubble bath or a massage. And it's, I guess maybe it's almost like the kind of romantic connotations a little bit as well. Like, I'll treat myself to some nice underwear. You know, that it can, it can go in that direction as well, can't it? Whereas this one, it seems like it is more about you sort of becoming the best version of you. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, I think I think helps a lot. In addition to questioning whether self-love is really necessary, another big barrier to self-love is the belief that it's narcissistic or selfish. That might be another area where the ick comes in a little bit. Is there a fine line between self-obsessed and self-love too? Yeah, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. We all have to be a little bit narcissistic. Like, like it's it's actually healthy to have a little bit of narcissism. So when we're children, we count on our parents to give us this love. So imagine I've I'm a kid. I've just come back from school. I've made this little drawing with crayons. I'm so proud of it. I've shown it to my my parents. They've been like, "Oh my god, Tasha, this painting's amazing. This drawing's amazing. We're gonna put it on the fridge for everybody to see. You're mm-hmm. such an artist." that's going to fill me up with so much love and worth and respect that Mm. I will then carry with me whenever I do a drawing or whenever I share my work or whenever I have to do a a public speaking gig I have this you know this internal self-worth that I'm internalized for my parents in that moment and that is healthy narcissism Mm. but when it becomes that I'm at the center of everything I am the best artist in the whole world. Mm-hmm. No one can beat me. When it's like I am putting myself in front of everybody in terms of not having that, that not having to see that, putting ourselves in front of people is, is what we need to do. But if I'm putting myself in front of somebody else, but at their detriment or ruining them to make me myself look good, that's where it's unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, so we all do need a little sprinkle of narcissism because that's where our self-worth starts it's when we can look in the mirror and say do you know what I look good today Mm. or I feel good today or actually I've got good things to say today like whatever it is we need to have that you know to be able to put ourselves on a pedestal a little bit of like I'm good at these things and I'm gonna own that Mm. why not Mm. why do I have to be shy about it uh yeah and that's I suppose why they say a lot that like you need to really love yourself before you know seeking it from a romantic partner it's it's mm-hmm. otherwise you're seeking that validation from from the wrong place mm-hmm. do you mm-hmm. see that a lot yeah I have a funny relationship with that quote another quote of like if you can't love yourself how are you gonna love anybody else I have a funny relationship with that because I feel like I agree with it and I don't agree with it um I think Yes, it's it's really helpful to love yourself before you go into a relationship. But again, if you've never experienced real and healthy love, how will you learn to give yourself real and healthy love? And sometimes having a going into a relationship which is healthy and balanced can give us the tools to kind of internalize that to ourselves. Hmm. But it, it's going to be a struggle because, like you said, you'll you'll seek validation, you will seek them to love you the way that you need. Like, there's going to be a struggle, so it can be really helpful to have therapy during that time. Yeah. But I think it is possible to to learn to love yourself while you're learning to love a new person as well. Hmm. Going back to childhood, how does the impact that childhood have on us affect our levels of self worth and self esteem and loving who we are as we grow up? Mm-hmm. So I think it very much starts with being born and our primary care caregiver, which normally is a mother, kind of how that interaction is. Um, so even things like eye contact, the baby looks at the mother, the mother looks at the baby, and that's the first kind of signal or communication of love and safety mm-hmm. and oh, this person's here to look after me and look after all my needs and I can feel safe with them. And then that means that I can feel safe within myself and within my body. So that's kind of where self-love starts in those very little moments. And then even things like the roles that we play in our families. 
if we are, for example, the family scapegoat, where we're the troublemaker, we always are the ones that get told off, it's always our fault, that's going to then damage the self-love that we have of ourselves because we're always going to carry that narrative of things are always my fault mm. and I'm always a bad one and I'm always a troublemaker, um, which then kind of impacts the conversations that we have of ourselves and, you know, things like going for our goals. Mm. I'm not going to go for my goal if I always believe that I'm the bad one. Why would I do that? You know, so yeah. those kind of things really do feed into uh, our self-love and our self-love journey. You posted something on Instagram recently and it really struck a chord. This is keeping on the subject of childhood. Telling a client in therapy that their tendency to over-apologise, fear of conflict and need for control comes from childhood trauma they didn't realise they had. So, and it was liked by Vex King, no less. <laughs> Amongst many, many others. <laughs> But then is, is that something that we do need to kind of maybe look at in, in if there was areas where, you know, for whatever reason, there was a lack of what we perceived to be that love and nourishment that, that we needed. And so that's kind of made our own relationship with ourselves skewed as we've grown up. Yeah, because a lot of those things are kind of people pleasing tendencies, right? And I think sometimes there's things that we do that are socially very acceptable, like, you know, apologising, over-apologising is, you know, we love that in British culture, <laughs> for example, and giving all of ourselves to people, again, is very socially acceptable, but actually they're things that they're socially acceptable, but as an individual, they take away from ourselves mm -hmm. and they take away from our self-love. If my self-love was a... um I don't know, a cake or something. I'm giving all my slices to everybody else and then I have no slices for me. So how is that self-love? That's actually me giving all my love to everybody else and not giving it to myself. So I think there's something about working out the balance between how do I love me and how do I love my community at the same time? Mm. And then what about resentment and letting go? In terms of like releasing resentment, how many times have you heard yourself or somebody, you know, you know, say... I didn't sign up for this. So mm -hmm. letting go of those negative thoughts and emotions, that must be a huge step in terms of like working our way up, up the self-love scale. Absolutely. I feel like resentment is a sign that we didn't set our boundaries mm. or we allowed someone to overstep our boundaries mm. and then we're left with this anger of like, oh my gosh, now I'm carrying this thing that I didn't want to carry. And so it's important to take that, you know, when we have resent resentment, it's to take that as a lesson of like, okay, what do I need to do now? What do I need to action? How do I claim back my boundaries? How do I make sure that this doesn't happen again? And what is the conversation I need to have with that person so that they stop taking as much from me as they are currently? Mm. What do you think as well about like, you know, the negative thoughts that we all suffer with ruminating thoughts and again I suppose it's part of that letting go and detaching which is easier said than done have you got mm. any advice there because we get so many more negative thoughts every mm. hour of every day than we do positive ones unfortunately and I know it's like what we attach um, and give power to we can take ourselves down in that respect and then it's like well why do I deserve to speak kindly to myself you know because we speak worse to ourselves yeah. than we would do anybody else right absolutely 100 percent. and i think naturally our mind will focus on the negative than it will on the positive and it will especially also focus on what's familiar rather than what's unfamiliar so if we've again if we've grown up with teachers who said negative things about us or parents or family or whatever that narrative is going to be very ingrained mm. and so it's going to be very quick to come every hour mm. um compared to other other positive affirmation the things that we are really unfamiliar with so one of my things would be to when you hear that negative thought is firstly to like okay focus on it for a second and say actually whose voice is that is that mm -hmm. my voice is that my English teacher from back in the day's voice is that my mom's like whose voice is that and just try and connect to see if there's a memory of, of that that's connected to that particular word or or sentence um just so that you can separate it from yourself for a moment 
And then the other thing is to have what I call like a fa- fairy godmother, <laughs> <laughs> which is it might be a person that you know, um, maybe like someone who's very warm and nurturing and affirming. So it might be someone that you know already or someone that you knew, maybe like you might have had a grandparent who was really loving, encouraging. Or if you don't can't think of anybody, think of someone in a TV show or in a film that you just love. Um, so for example, um Grace and Frankie, which one's which? When um the one with the long hair. Yeah, Grace is Jane Fonda and then Frankie is I can't recall the actress's name. She's the one with the long hair, she's the more hippie one. So so Frankie is one of my fairy godmothers because I just think she would be like an awesome <laughs> fairy godmother. Yes. But I just whenever like I have like a negative thought, I think, oh, what would thank what would Frankie say about that? <laughs> um and I'm sure she'd have like a really cool, encouraging, like Oh my you know, god, I love screw that. The, screw, yeah. Whoever it is, she'll be like, you know, screw the back whatever it is, she'll, she'll like just, you know, have the best counter argument for whatever that negative thought is. So having like someone like that in mind that you can just kind of use to like be your lawyer in that if you win if you're in court with your negative <laughs> thoughts, who's gonna be your lawyer? And you know, that's Frankie's mind. So yeah. Oh my god, that's brilliant. I think mine <laughs> might be Moira in Shits Creek. <laughs> oh amazing <laughs> you'd be like don't speak that. to my baby like that my babies <laughs> I love that <laughs> yeah, I love that that's a great idea how else can we put self-love into practice then as we're starting to wrap things up um I would say I think we've spoken about a lot in terms of like individually like how does one person develop their self-love but Mm -hmm. I think there's so much strength in doing it as a community so whether you have friends who are on a similar Mm -hmm. journey Mm -hmm. you know when you're going for brunch or for coffee or whatever have a little conversation about it or ask what each other are working on or if you're if someone's in therapy ask how's the therapy going like because I've had so many clients who maybe they've spoken to their friends about therapy who aren't in therapy but they learn something by learning about what my clients were learning in therapy so like having those conversations where you're just like talking a bit about your healing journey or where you are with yourself or whatever Mm. there's great games like um we're not really strangers oh my god love that game it's like a card game with like reflective questions and you can play them with plate with friends there's a self-love pack oh wow yeah I really recommend there's a self-love pack there's a relationship pack there's a breakup pack there's a healing pack They're, they're amazing um but you could even just bring that if you're friends or whatever like trying to just it's great to have alone time to work on self-love, but also as humans, we're not supposed to be in isolation. Mm. We, we actually heal best as part of a community or in a relationship with other people that we trust mm. and feel safe with. So I would say really lean into that. It doesn't have to be that you're just doing it alone in your flat or whatever, like, you know, allow it to be in other parts of your life as well. Yeah, it's so nourishing, isn't it, for the soul when you have those conversations that go beyond oh how's the family like what have you been up to this week you know that kind of that kind of everyday stuff should we say and I would add that going to see a therapist is a great act of self-love and Mm self-care absolutely and if you can't afford a therapist which I know is a lot of people like you've got these great podcasts you've got loads of books Mm -hmm. out there okay let's talk about journaling really quickly journaling doesn't have to be writing in a journal every single day like dear diary blah 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 it can just be whenever you feel like able to and ready to connect with yourself in that space so it might be that you're using the we're not really strangers cards and then something comes up and you want to write about it or it might be that you watch a show and it reminds you of something and you want to write about it it doesn't have to be consistent doesn't have to be every day it can just be whenever you want to it can be Mm. using your notes app it could be drawing stick men whatever it is Mm. you know just allowing yourself to connect with yourself on paper can be really helpful speaking of writing you're currently writing your first non-fiction book which is called real talk therapy lessons in living and healing so this is going to be published in september by radar books and it's available for pre-order now via amazon waterstones audible and apple that's exciting yeah (laughs) Yes, it's really exciting and it's really interesting because like my we've actually slightly tweaked the title to be 
a therapeutic lessons in self-love and healing and it's just really interesting because ah. the whole writing process has been really like a test on my self-love oh, <laughs> it's really? been really like interesting in terms of like you know this whole thing of like what are people gonna think but what do I think <sighs> like it's, it's just been really interesting but it's it's gonna be a great book in terms of giving people the tools to work on their self-love journey mm. and understand the impact of their past to their present and how they move forward more freely. Um, and lots of metaphor, lots of Harry Potter examples, <laughs> lots of uh, reflection questions. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. And there's going to be a collection of therapy lessons. So I wondered if you could give us a sneak peek into like yeah. a, a lesson in terms of, again, through the lens of self-love. Yeah, okay, let me think. Have you got a fave little nugget that you wouldn't mind sharing? Okay. My favourite topic, so I'm, I'm a bit of a trauma geek. <laughs> I love <laughs> talking about trauma. So I'm sorry, it's like not, not the most lightest topic. But um, <laughs> I talk a little bit there about like the psychoeducation and what happens in the brain with trauma and it being like a house. So we have our downstairs house and we the downstairs of the house and the upstairs of our house and when we've experienced trauma or when we're triggered mm. our brain only operates in the downstairs part of our house which is where it's like our basic needs so food so we've got the kitchen food living room like we have to put this list this lesson into one nugget but mm -hmm. it's basically kind of like whereas upstairs is our reflection it's like where we can rest, where we can get nurture, where we can, you know, have that higher insight of ourselves of like, oh, I'm triggered right now. What do I need? I actually need a blanket and maybe this have it fun. So when we're triggered, we can't get to that upstairs level. Right. It, it won't let us. We can only be like, oh, my God, I'm hungry. Oh, my God, I'm angry. We can't get to that higher level until we can have some safety in place. Um, so I explain that a little bit more in the book and how to do that and what that's about and all the little stuff. So that's like one of the chapters. And then I've got like lessons around things like body shame and sex and uh, attachment, mommy and daddy issues, intersectionality. There's like a little lessons about each thing. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. you're really making sure as well that you um, make it as inclusive as possible for, for all to be seen and heard. Um, which I wouldn't expect anything less after chatting to you. Final question. <laughs> I ask every guest to set us some homework based on the theme of the episode. So in this case, Tasha, what is a simple, actionable first step we can take when it comes to self-love that will help us on a mission to building a happier life? I think it's going to be working out who your fairy godmother is um <laughs> love that as a response love that i think it's working out who you're and you might even have you know a fairy good mother a fairy good father a fairy good per you might have a whole crew of fairy gods a gunkle um, a fairy go gunkle gay uncle absolutely like have a whole crew um and make it fictional and real people that you know as well um or even people that maybe you you don't know them but you have an idea of how you think they're gonna be if that makes sense mm -hmm. um like i feel like rihanna's gonna be like an amazing would be an amazing god fairy godmother but i don't know her so but I, <laughs> my picture of her is that she will be so right. you know have have a little crew of of those and and if you if you don't know what to do from that is maybe watch something with those people in them and maybe write a quote or a line that they say that you want to say back to yourself when you're having a difficult moment oh, amazing stuff yeah in a way that is doing affirmations but just in a more cool and less affirmation anyway <laughs> <laughs> fun for more on you instagram it's realtalk.therapist same for tiktok at realtalk.therapist your website is www.realtalktherapist.co.uk and as we mentioned you can pre-order the book Real Talk yes. Therapy Lessons in Self-Love and Healing now. Tasha, this has been so fab. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tasha, for such a great conversation. And thank you to you, my friend, for listening to another episode of the Happier Life Project. 
with me, Gabby Sanderson. Now for the important housekeeping. If you are suffering with your mental health, there is a crisis button on the My Possible Self app, which will signpost you to the correct information for immediate expert advice. Those of you who are listening on one of the podcast platforms, the My Possible Self app is completely free to download, so you don't need to worry about it costing you anything. Make sure you subscribe and leave a review if you found this episode helpful, please. And to find and follow us on social media if you don't already, we are at My Possible Self and I've been at Radio Gabby. Please do take care and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.